Hello everyone. So this is me again, um, Quentin Verspiren. So I can see we have uh, 15 attendees for now. So, so let's wait a couple of minutes um, that people transfer from the previous session. Uh, and then I will be really glad to leave the floor to my friend, Dr. Sese for his uh, roughly 15 minute presentations followed by around 15 minutes of questions and answer. So, yes. Let's wait maybe when we have around 35 to 40 attendees, which is most of people here, we can start. And for those of you who may have issues with the Aramid platform during the speech, um, you can anyway um, find it on YouTube as a live session. So, so in case you disconnect, just check YouTube so you can at least uh, follow Dr. Sisse's speech. And I believe one of my colleagues from the organizing team will send the YouTube link in the session chat. So I think many participants have joined. So we will be able to start the session. So I already introduced you uh, with many details, the, the very interesting background and activities of um, Dr. Sese. I will just add one point that was not mentioned in the biography you had in your, in your guide, which is that uh, currently Dr. Sese is doing something uh, really important, which is to help um, schools from remote areas in Mindanao, so the big island in the southern part of the Philippines, to get uh, internet connection. And Dr. Sese has been in the mountain with little connection for many weeks. And he has just came back from his uh, trip to install all this uh, to present for us. And he will soon go back for a few more weeks. So, so first of all, Rohel, thank you very much for coming back from this very important trip for us. <laughs> And no problem. I will let you present. And so if you can try to share your slides. Okay. And then I will mute myself and and let you present. Okay. So can you see my slide? Uh, yes, it's appearing. Yes, I can see your slide. So I mute myself and the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you, Quentin, for that introduction and uh pointing out that uh, one of the things I've been doing is uh, uh, going to different areas here in the Philipp southern part of the Philippines to bring connectivity to using satellite or using space technology, which is uh, always a very exciting but also very challenging thing. So a uh, pleasant good afternoon to everyone. So it's my, uh, I'm honored to be here to talk to you or to be in this uh, Asia Pacific Space Generation online workshop. Uh, to be to talk about how things are going in the Asia Pacific region in terms of uh, having established an emerging space nation. So I'm very happy that uh, the Asia Pacific uh, Space Generation Workshop has progressed has uh, has progressed for quite some time now. And in fact, I, I was there during the very first two the very first session in uh, in Japan. I think that was 2014, and it has gone a long way in meeting and uh, convening different uh, space uh, science scientists, researchers, students, and enthusiasts in the Asia-Pacific region uh, and try to come up with things that will, can affect the whole uh, region itself and how to improve the level of space capabilities here. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, for this afternoon, I'll be talking to you about space in the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, which is what we, where we are in right now. And uh, we can see that uh, there's a lot of diversity that has been happening in this region when it comes to space activities. Uh, but when you look at, uh, start when we start first with the history of space activities, uh, we can see that for the past 50, 60 years, a lot has progressed and a lot has changed when it comes to space uh, activities back in the 1960s, back uh, 650s, 60s, 70s, most of space activities were led by uh, what we now know as established uh, space power or established space nation, namely the United States, uh, the former USSR, and then uh, you have a handful of other countries as well. 
uh, like Canada, France, Europe, uh, France, uh, UK, and uh, Italy, who has been doing space activities. Uh, fast forward to what where we are right now, and we can see that uh, the landscape of space has changed a lot. Uh, it's no longer just the domain of uh, advanced uh, countries or economically advanced countries, but now we can see more and more countries that are putting up their own national space program, putting up their own national space agencies. And this has seen, uh, this shows how much space has democratized over the past 50, 60 years. So now we have countries like here in the Asia Pacific region, in Africa, in South America, that are already engaged in space uh, activities, whether it's uh, building their own satellites or using space applications uh, for their own national benefit. Just in the past five years, five to 10 years alone, uh, we can see more than 10 uh, national space agencies that have been established. I have to take note here that uh, Right now, one of the youngest uh, space nation in the world is the Philippines, where, in, uh, where I come from. And we established our own Philippine Space Agency as of uh, August 2019. And that has been the work that we have been doing for the past, uh, 60, uh, for, for the past six years. So here in the Asia Pacific region, when we look at the landscape of space, we can see that it's mainly, we can classify the different countries into several tiers. The, the top tier are those countries that are advanced when it comes to space capabilities, namely Japan, uh, China, and India. So in Japan, you have JAXA. You, in China, you have CNSA. In India, you have ISRO. So these countries have decades of history when it comes to uh, doing space capabilities. Well, all, all three of these countries have their capabilities to launch rockets, uh, to launch satellites into space. Uh, like JAXA is a uh, participant to the International Space Station program. ISRO has its own independent uh, capabilities as well. And China is planning to have their own uh, space station in the near future. Now, when we go down a little bit further, we see some emerging space nations. Uh, and these are countries that are what we say that even though that they are emerging space nation, they are more economically advanced uh, to the point that they can have their own, they can go into certain activities that are usually not taken or not done by a new space, uh, emer by, by an emerging space nation. So I have to take note of a uh, couple of countries here, namely Australia, uh, which established their own space agency just a few years ago, and the same with the UAE space agency. So despite these countries being new to having their own space agency, they're relatively more economically advanced. And for Australia, they have a long history already of space capabilities and uh, participating or partnering with the US in terms of uh, developing their capabilities. So they're a little bit ahead in terms of the pack, in terms of uh, uh, what they can do and uh, what they have ambition, what uh, they have. Uh, and then we have here the other emerging space nations as well. Most of these are concentrated in the South uh, Southeast Asian region. Uh, like the, uh, the Philippines, uh, Vietnam, well, Malaysia and Indonesia and Thailand as well have been also have their own space programs uh, in the past decades. Uh, so here we can see that uh, these countries are a little bit uh, different on how they approach the uh, building their own capabilities uh, in the in in terms of space. And also, what we have to look into here is. Uh, Given that the three major countries, India, uh, China, and Japan, are all uh, top uh, space nations, they're, they have activity that tryly, or that in a way tries to uh, extend their influence beyond, beyond their national borders when it comes to space. So these are mainly space cooperation activities, like what we have with Japan with the Asia Pacific Regional Space Agency Forum, and with China, you have the Asia Pacific Space Cooperation Organization. So the or APSCO. So the APRSAF is a more of a voluntary basis, and uh, every year they have this uh, annual convention. Uh, and just and this is this is in fact one of the side events, uh, right, of the APRSAF this year. But on the other hand, you have APSCO, which is more uh, formal in terms of cooperation. Uh, but you have fewer nations that usually participate with APSCO. So there's a bigger commitment in participating with APSCO. So both of uh, countries are uh, using uh, APRCF to and APSCO 
to extend their cooperation agreements with, uh, with different countries in the Asia-Pacific region. So one of the things or one of the questions that usually gets asked is why are countries rushing to space? Uh, when you look at the history of why countries would venture into space, uh, it's for two major reasons. One is for prestige. The other is for developing the military technologies. However, with the current technology and uh, capabilities that we have now, this has a little bit, uh, this has shifted a little bit. Uh, we have countries that while they don't have the capability yet of building their own satellite, uh, they are very much users of space data, space applications in various in various areas, such as agriculture and fisheries, environment and land use, and communications. I think I have to take note of uh, communications here because uh, because of the COVID nineteen pandemic, we have seen that communications is one of the key assets that we have right now uh, in order remain uh, connected with the rest of the world, given the uh, restrictions travel that we have. So we have areas that are uh, disconnected of the world, and this is where uh, using technology comes uh, very comes well into play in terms of uh, bridging what we call the last mile and bridging the digital divide. Also, for countries, especially in the Southeast Asian region, the use of uh, satellite capabilities for disaster management important. Uh, we have uh, just in the field, for example, here in the Philippines, we normally have uh, around 20 typhoons a year. And uh, having the, uh, the information on where a typhoon would strike and uh, ex uh, looking at what would be the, what the extent of the damage is would greatly help in terms of disaster management and risk reduction as well. Uh, so we, we can see here that uh, most of the countries in the Asia Pacific region have transcended beyond the prestige, beyond the developing military capabilities, but they are now more into developing expertise uh, for a specific technology, specific application, and also developing a broad range of space applications, just uh, like what I have mentioned. And but we can also look at these countries. Uh, that also have some ambition in terms of having what we call independent access to space. And, uh, for example, in Indonesia, there's also a plan of uh, uh, Indonesia and Philippines are looking into having their own space uh, launching capabilities. Australia is doing that as well. Uh, New Zealand has done that with, uh, with Rocket Lab and uh, uh, for, they're do doing a very great job. So we can see here that it's the realm of space is just no longer uh, exclusive or the realm of space la uh, launching objects into space is no longer exclusive to advanced uh, spacefaring nations. But now it's given the plethora of uh, small rocket launchers that are being developed right now, uh, we can see more and more of these. And this poses sometimes a bit of an issue in terms of uh, security and sustainability. And uh, I think this is where uh, advanced, uh, sp uh, established space nation and emerging space nation have to look into on how they can work together in terms of protecting their uh, the space environment, ensuring space security, and ensuring space sustainability. And also, this is where uh, emerging space nation should be a little bit more vocal in terms of what their country needs when it comes to space capabilities. So normally when you look at the way on how things are, have been done when it comes to international agreements, it's more, mainly dominated by established space nation. But now emerging space nations and even private sectors are coming into play with a little bit more agility and they, to the point that sometimes they can skip certain uh, steps in, term, in developing their capabilities uh, being able to uh, skip some of those steps have enabled them to leapfrog a bit in terms of technology and the agility, the, the lack of uh, uh, bureaucratic baggage that comes with having a space program also makes them very adaptable to the current, uh, current situation right now. So this means that even though you're an emerging space nation, you have that voice or you have that uh, way of being an active participant in the international space community, as well as you have the responsibility, at the same time, you have that responsibility of becoming a responsible space actor as well. So it's this uh, meeting uh, between established and emerging space nations 
uh, that would be a key in the future of uh, developing space capabilities, probably not just in the Asia Pacific region, but also in the, in the rest of the world. Go ahead. Now, I'm, I, I, go ahead. Uh, sorry, I'm just interrupting like, you. Like, One second, you. some participants second, some are asking if you can hide the message about stop sharing on your ah, okay. screen. Sorry. <laughs> ah, no, sorry. I mean, you have to share, but click on the hide just oh, okay. close to the stop sharing because they wanted to read some of the information that was very sorry, sorry, yeah, sorry to interrupt. Okay. Try that again. Okay. Okay. Better. Let's see. Perfect. Thank you. Sorry about that. Anyway, okay. Go, uh, going back, so I, I'll, I'll just take uh, make an example of uh, what we did here in the Philippines in terms of uh, creating our own space program. Uh, some people think that this happened overnight, but the reality is that uh, it, it has been a work that has been going on for six, eight years now. We started way back in 2013 with assessing what the country has in terms of infrastructure and human assets, and then crafting the space policy as well, uh, having the first technical cooperation with Japan uh, with the launch of our microsatellites and developing the ground space, and then doing uh, the cost-benefit analysis and establishing key space roadmaps and agenda and fostering international cooperation and partnerships. And then the last part is formalization of uh, formalizing the Philippine Space Agency through a national law uh, and one of the things that uh, I think the Philippines is, in a way, can become a role model in terms of uh, emerging space nations, that we are one of the few countries in the world that right at the er very early stages of our national space program, we have taken, a, uh, we have looked not just on the technical aspect of developing space capabilities, but also on the policy aspect, because we came uh, in, the, we came here with the understanding that as an emerging space nation, we want to be a responsible space actor. We want to become, uh, we want to partner not just with advanced or with established space nations, but also with other emerging space nations. And then using the lessons that we learned on how to establish a national space program in a relatively short amount of time with its own space policy as well, with all its own roadmaps. Uh, these are some of the experiences that uh, the Philippines can actually put forth uh, in terms of uh, helping other space nations becoming a responsible space actor. So, as I mentioned, uh, the law was signed in 2019, and uh, one of the most important aspects of this law is that it establishes not just the space agency itself, but also the space policy. Uh, so this means that there's already a direction on what are we, what we call on what are the key development roadmaps that the Philippines will venture into on why it is embarking on a national space program. So these key development areas are namely national security and development, hazard management and climate studies, space research and development, space industry capacity building, space education and awareness, and in finally in international cooperation. So this is a a public document in case you want to look at this just google the number of the republic act uh, republic act 11363 and all of these information is uh, actually there so I'll, I'll end my talk with what uh what we have uh, some recommendations on based on what we have experienced here in the philippines and these are recommendations that uh, we put forth uh we bring to the table on for other emerging space nations that we have to uh, that can take note of. Uh, when we were doing our own national program, we looked at how other countries were doing at or their own programs as well. What has been done in the past, uh, what were what went wrong, what went right, and so on. And then trying to look at what would be the best for our situation. So when establishing its uh, national space program, most of the time. People are, are bureaucrats are in the dark on what needs to be done first, uh, what, how, how would it go, uh, which areas need to be focused uh, in terms of development. But the very first step that we recommend is uh, actually conducting what we call a baseline study or an assessment on what are the existing space assets, infrastructures, and capabilities within the, within the country, and how are these assets being utilized. Then comes uh, the second part is analyzing space policies and pro programs of other countries and trying not to exactly copy what other countries have done, but more of assessing we which ones 
are more suitable for your own country because uh, each nation would have its own uh, problems, issues, requirements as well, and their capabilities. So there's no, uh, it's not recommended that you copy exactly how other countries have done it, but try to see which ones would be more tailored, uh, which, be, which ones would be more suitable uh, for your own country so that you would tailor fit your own program to what your country needs. Also, you have to involve as many agencies as possible in different sectors as well. Uh, so, because we know that uh, uh, space technology and applications goes beyond boundaries of space, it goes into other areas as well. So, it's better to involve other uh, areas and other sectors, such as the academe, the industry, government, or in some cases, even the defense sector have to be involved. You also need to have a small team that does most of the work in crafting of the policy and the roadmaps. We have a saying that too many cooks spoil the broth. So there has to be a small team that uh, dedicated to do most of the lab work, but at the same time, uh, taking in the inputs from the other sectors. At the same time, you need to have a long-term perspective in terms of space development, but you have to take into account short-term political situation or changes. Uh, the next one is, I think, one of the most important uh, uh, recommendations, especially if we want to have what we call long-term changes in our space uh, environment, or uh, sp not space environment, space, uh, space policy. You have to educate politicians and decision makers uh, in terms of the value ben and benefits of having national space program. So I think uh, for most scientists and researchers, this is one of the most the very difficult work. We don't want to deal with politicians and decision makers, but we have to, at some point, we really have to do that because if they understood why we need to, why a country would need to have a national space program, it would definitely make the, the work uh, a lot easier for everyone else. And it uh, you can really influence uh, the policy landscape or the law of the land when you do, uh, when you educate politicians. Uh, at the same time, you have to look at uh, doing very minimal exposure at the start until everything has been laid down and then ramp up in terms of gaining public support. So the, these educating politicians and gaining public support goes hand in hand. Uh, cooperating with other space-faring and space emerging nation, emerging space nations, not just for technology exchanges and human resources, but also for exchanging best practices on what, uh, how we can do things. And eventually, this would hopefully lead to something more from regional uh, cooperation agreement. And most of the time, we look at only what we call north-south cooperation, but that we also have to look into south-south uh, cooperation. Uh, cooperating with equals or with countries that are at the, at, at the equal or at the same level on, as your own goes a very long way because you would go hand in hand in terms of uh, developing not just your own capability but other countries countries capability as well and lastly and this is i think where uh, emerging space nation can very well uh, change the game or change uh, the landscape having the recognition that you need to have your own space law and policy even at the very early stages of your program goes a very long way because uh, it eliminates a lot of uh, gray areas on why a program needs to be done. It uh, pushes uh, the public support as well and it pushes the decision makers into having uh, and finally legislating their own uh, space agency or space program. And in the long term, increase it, hopefully this would increase the, the funding for space activities in your own country. So with that, I'll end my talk with uh, this uh, very short uh, proverb from Africa. And this has, uh, this has uh, worked very well for us in the Philippines, uh, that if you want to go fast, you go alone. You want to do things uh, by yourself because you need to do things very quickly. But if you want to go far, you have to go together. So this is where... Uh, at the, for emerging space nation, you want to do things on your own at first, but later on you have to seek out cooperation because when you look at the space community, uh, no country is an island and everyone has to work together towards the protection of the space environment and eventually uh, having space as a her common heritage of mankind. So with that, I'll end my talk and uh, I'm open to questions. Thank you.
Thank you very much. And so, as I explained to the delegates before, I I predicted that it would be a fascinating presentation, and it was. And so, Rohel, if you can put the slide with the recommendations, I think you can put it back. Uh, I think it would be nice just to keep it in the background, uh, in particular for the group I'm moderating, Working Group 1 on Asia-Pacific Space Development. Uh, take a screenshot. That's all you need to know. That's really important. Uh, we have a few questions in the Q&A box, so I will read some of them. Um, first from Kirchel Nodado, a question from the University of the Philippines uh, Marine Science Institute. Hello, Dr. Sese. First of all, I'd like to thank you for the dedication you have given for FILSA. Hence, I'd like to ask, how were you able to come up with the foundation of FILSA? Which is entered on this slide. So that's why <laughs> if you want to add okay. something, you can do. And I want yeah. to combine it with a question from uh, Kim Yebin from the University of Sheffield, who says, Hi, Dr. Sese. And I'd like to ask that the global trend of new space um, is emerging. And as the founder of FILSA, FILSA has a plan, or do you have thoughts about, um, sorry, I lost the question. So to raise and support commercial companies related to space. So is it the role of FILSA to, in your, in the way you designed it, to support okay. uh, new space? Okay. Uh, so, okay. So uh, I'll start with uh, Kershell. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, but it's actually not just me who uh, made the foundation. It's actually a, a work of a team uh, and a lot of people who were working in the uh, in the background when uh, we were still establishing the, the space program. Um, so I think it's more of the realization that uh, you need to have as, uh, a lot of in agencies and sectors involved in order to progress uh, very quickly as well. Because they, at some point when you are talking to legislators, to other uh, agencies, they sort of like become your allies. And it, it helps a lot in terms of... Uh, lightening the workload for 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 pushing a, a space program so having a lot uh, of different uh, partners and uh, uh, agencies involved go, went a long way and uh, as I said uh, the, the the foundation of how filsa came into came to came to being is uh, here uh, basically the, the summary of what went what happened uh, in the past now in uh, for the question of uh, Yebin Kim, uh, in, yeah, that's true. Nowadays, uh, new space is now becoming uh, more prevalent. We have more and more uh, private companies that are venturing in, not just into satellite development or space applications, but even launching capabilities as well. Uh, and this is very much uh, the, the for, for the Philippines, uh, this is very much reflected in terms of our, uh, based on our space policy, which I'll, I'll flash it a bit. So, so you, if you look at the space policy of the Philippines, uh, one of the key areas, uh, key development areas that we looked into is space industry capacity building. So uh, in a way, there is a mandate that uh, the, the space agency should recognize uh, new space capabilities, uh, uh, new space companies that are uh, private, uh, private companies, uh, and then they become part of the national space program. So whether they, whether the laws of a country would allow public money being to be channeled to private companies, that would depend on different countries, uh, based on the country itself. But I think looking at the landscape right now, it's important that emerging space nations should also recognize not just the traditional way of doing space, but also the new way of doing space through these new space companies. It's uh, And they have the advantage, the, the emerging space nations have the advantage because they have a little bit more, bureau, I, I would call it bureaucratic agility, that they can deal with new space companies in a much easier manner compared to if you're running a national space program for several decades now. So for, for emerging space, nation, I think it's very important that uh, having new space, recognizing new space companies uh, on what they can con contribute, private sector involvement as well, uh, would go a long way. Okay, so we will okay. keep the session around three minutes, so maybe two questions uh, quickly answered. Um, so one question is very simple is, 
how do you educate politicians and decision makers? And it relates to another question, which is how do you mitigate the fact that politicians or government um, like bureaucrats are often focusing on short term issues? And how do you make okay. sure that they're interested in the long term ones? OK, uh, probably uh, it, it, it's two things. For a long term perspective, uh, it, it, it's going to be a big challenge to make that make uh, decision makers, politicians and decision makers understand that. So that having the long term perspective on space development is more of a burden or more of a on the, uh, the, the task rests more with the experts like the scientists, engineers, and uh, so that they would be the ones who would craft what would be the long-term perspective in terms of space development. But at the same time, you have to look into what are the political, short-term political realities, because you can use those short-term political realities to, in a way, influence or I should say, educate the politician and decision makers on why we want to do this or why we want to have a space program. So for us, it, it was really, for, for me personally, for me, it was one of the most challenging things because uh, I had to talk to congressmen, congressman, senator, and explain them uh, why we need to have. But having an understanding of where the legislators are coming from, where the politicians are coming from, would also go a very long way because, I, and I've, I've done this in, in a lot of times, I'm using the same PowerPoint, but knowing, for example, this, this congressman is more leaning towards social services. This congressman is leading more towards uh, communications and uh, science and technology. So having that understanding of where their, uh, where their hearts are in terms of, uh, in, terms of po in, in politics, goes a long way because you can craft the discussion, you can craft the, uh, the, the, yeah, the discussion with them in a manner that they are more keen on listening because it's, you're tackling an issue that they themselves have a personal stake on it, that they're something that they're really advocating for. So I think that is one of the biggest lessons that we have learned that there's no one size fits all presentation for politicians and decision makers. You have to do a little bit of work. You need to do a li little bit of, well, not just a little bit, a lot of research on what their backgrounds are, what were the previous laws that they legislated, and try to align your uh, the, the, your program or what you're pushing in, in, in a way that they can understand. You cannot go to them on a very technical manner. You go talking to them all about the tech, the issues of uh, how satellites are developed or how rockets are launched and so on, they won't listen to you. You'll end that in, in you, immediately that, that, that shuts the door for them. But if you take your time into simplifying without dumbing down your, your, the way of your, you're discussing with them, that would go a long way. And I'll, I'll take note of one example that, uh, Normally, we have an hour of uh, discussion with a legislator, but there was one instance that we only had 15 minutes to talk with a senator, and it's, we had to convince that senator to support the space program, the space legislation. Uh, otherwise, that's going to be a very big problem because it's, he's an influential senator. So 15 minutes. So unfortunately, well, I didn't do it in 15 minutes. I was able to do it in 10 minutes alone. So in 10 minutes, yes, he, he, he gave his yes that uh, we're, this I'm supporting this and this is uh, one of the key issues or the key legislations that uh, we'll be working on. And that went a long way. So having that understanding uh, of uh, where they come from, not just where you're coming from, would greatly help in pushing for a national space agenda. Thank you very much. So unfortunately, we had a lot of questions at the last minute, but we are already late for the next session, which will be very interesting with Dr. Ishikita on space medicine. So, so I would like to close this one. We'll find a way to keep the, the question, to save the questions and maybe send it to Dr. Sese if he can just answer in a few sentences. Um, so we'll um, answer your questions. Uh, so thank you very much. I'm okay with that. <laughs> okay, so yeah, thank you very much. Uh, the session will close in a few seconds. It was a pleasure to have you, and obviously everyone you, really enjoyed. Everyone. And so for all the um, delegates, 
uh, please join the next session in the sessions tab and you will have uh, the presentation on space medicine by Dr. Ishikita. So thank you again, Dr. Sese.